When Thomas Alva Edison invented the light bulb, it's a sure bet that very few people, if anybody, foresaw its consequences. The lighting up of the planet like a star. This is one of the most beautiful and thrilling images of our presence on Earth. This blazing glow, a man-made phenomenon that establishes the borders of the first world. It's also evidence of the energy we waste, of the light we let dissipate into space. From the advent of fire to man's control of the atomic building blocks of life, humans have diligently attempted to control nature, control progress, control the energy ensconced in the earth. This car practically emits no adverse contaminants. It's the NACAR 5, one of several prototypes developed by Daimler Chrysler. Its engine runs on methanol, a chemical compound that acts like a kind of storage device for liquid hydrogen. This car can reach a speed of over 150 kilometers per hour and cover a distance of 450 kilometers without refueling. Methanized hydrogen, in combination with oxygen, produces energy. This is the most advanced automobile in the world to date, using fuel cells. Hydrogen, of course, is plentiful, it's efficient, and it's clean. It's one of the universe's most basic elements, and just possibly may become one of our most important sources of energy in the future. Half a million years ago, the first hominids figured out how to unleash the chemical energy contained in wood into light and warmth. They discovered fire, and thus began mankind's search for ever more sophisticated sources of energy. Fire provided light, and it heated caves. It cooked food. With fire, we were able to work with metal, make glass, and bricks to build houses. Classical Greek mythology adopted fire as the symbol for mankind. The ancients said Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to men to turn them into supreme beings. Man has evolved side by side with the energy he has harnessed, needing it and controlling it. There was a time when we relied only on animals, rivers, and the wind. Around 50 BC, the Romans discovered hydraulic power and used it to grind wheat and pump water. Coal-fired power arrived in the Middle Ages. Actually, the term energy didn't enter the common lexicon until the end of the 18th century, when James Watt invented the steam engine and gave rise to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was a qualitative advance in human history and with respect to mankind's relationship to nature. Coal was the main source of energy for decades. Only in the mid-19th century did certain technological inventions demand the availability of new types of fuel. The first oil well was drilled in 1859 in Pennsylvania in the United States.
This dark, viscous liquid, formed in the Earth's womb over hundreds of millions of years, fired the first combustion engines. And factories, automobiles, trains, and airplanes. That was when the world seemed to start going faster. A century and a half later, the automobile has taken its place as one of the most representative icons of the state of human existence and progress. It's also the most emblematic feature of our species' tendency to waste resources and contaminate our environment. There are more than 6.3 billion human beings in the world right now. On average, each one of them uses about 1.6 tons of oil per year for energy. However, we should clarify this statistic because in fact, certain nuances should be pointed out. For example, in the United States and Canada, per capita oil consumption is around eight tons, while in dozens of less developed countries, the figure doesn't even reach 500 kilos, 16 times less. This doesn't necessarily imply that the inhabitants of the world's poorer regions are better energy conservationists, but rather that the statistics don't take into account the fact that over a third of the people living on this planet don't have access to electricity. As with food distribution, cycles of energy production and consumption clearly point to the marked differences between rich and poor countries. The developing countries, with 80% of the world's population, use less than one-third of all the energy produced in the world. Nevertheless, they suffer the same negative consequences of the planet's overall profligacy. The most serious consequence of all may be global warming. We believe, seriously, that climate change is a, a, a major threat for mankind. And so we think that uh, Kyoto is only a very first modest step in order to try to uh, uh, introduce the new policy. But we must do much more than that. Kyoto for Europe means 8% of reduction in 2010, between 2008 and 2012. But we need not decrease 8% uh, our emissions. We need to decrease 60 or 70%. And this means uh, radical new technology. We are seeing this technology emerging. Uh, this technology is mainly on the transportation sector, that is the sector that is growing faster in terms of uh, energy demand. We are seeing the fuel cell development. And uh, all the major carbon factors are promising between 2003, 2004, 2005 of bringing the first uh, pre-commercial uh, fuel cell uh, car. And so I believe that uh, in 10, 15 years, we will see fuel cell erupt as a major technology that uh, will enlarge the portfolio of fuels to produce hydrogen because fuel cells run with hydrogen to produce only water. Uh, this will um, be in the first uh, phase a push also for natural gas. That's why natural gas is now the preferred fuel for power generation and will be also for uh, motor propulsion. Uh, and uh, on the second step we will see, I think, renewables making a visible entrance in uh, uh, 10, 20 years time with uh, uh, extremely competitive wind power that's now being uh, almost competitive and probably with breakthrough uh, technology in PV, in photovoltaics. So I believe, like Shell, that uh, in, by 2050 we'll have 50% uh, of our needs supplied by renewables.